Hello and welcome to this first lecture for this Western Civilizations class. Today we'll explore ancient civilizations. There are a few themes to be addressed in this presentation. First of all, the two civilizations that we'll focus on will be Mesopotamia and Egypt. Secondly, while these ancient worlds had their high points centuries ago, we'll see how they continue to impact us today. We'll also explore some aspects of daily life in Mesopotamia and Egypt, as well as the role or function of laws and religion in their society. The first of these civilizations to explore would be Mesopotamia. Now you're probably saying to yourself, why did civilization begin in these regions of Mesopotamia and Egypt? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. It began there because they had access to something that everyone needs, and that would be water. The green area of this map identifies the location of ancient Mesopotamia, today's Middle East. Notice it's labeled here the Fertile Crescent. Much of the Middle East is surrounded by desert, yet in that green area there was access to water. The word Mesopotamia is actually Greek in its origins, and it means between the rivers. The two rivers it referred to would be the Tigris and Euphrates. These rivers flooded periodically, and while at times this could lead to flooding, they also deposited silt and other nutrients to the soils, and it provided water in an otherwise very dry environment. Here's another map of ancient Mesopotamia. The arrow is pointing to what's called the alluvial plain, or the area where those rivers flooded. They left behind a thick silt that made it easier to grow crops after the waters receded following the flood. Now, Mesopotamian society goes back to about 3000 BC, so you might be thinking, what does that have to do with me? However, they have a major impact on us today. And one example of this comes in the form of mathematics. They had a number system with a base of 60, and there were different combinations of sixes and tens that are seen. Today, we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 360 degrees in a circle. Now, our year is actually 365 days. Well, they had a calendar with 360 days, and what they would do is they would add an extra month every so often. And today we also have 24 hours in a day. So a lot of these numbers actually go back to Mesopotamia. Another way in which the Mesopotamians impact us today is in their form of writing. The Sumerians were one group in Mesopotamia and they invented what's called cuneiform. It was the first efficient system of writing. It was partly pictographic and partly included an alphabet. It's really difficult to overestimate the importance of writing. They were able to keep records, write laws, write down their histories and their religious beliefs, and they could even record their crop yields. Generally speaking, they would write these things on clay tablets. It would be soft, and then um, they would write in, in the clay, set it out in the sun, and it would become hard. This allowed them to maintain lots of different records. Generally speaking, they would use a stylus like the one where the arrow is pointing here, make their impressions in the clay, and then it could be permanently recorded and maintained. Here you see some examples of their numbers. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the numbers 1, 2, and 3. At the bottom of that column, the number 10 is circled. Toward the middle of the diagram, you see 36. And then in the bottom right, you see the number 59. How would you like to add and subtract those, or multiply and divide them? Doesn't sound like fun. Just as English evolves over time and we get new words, the cuneiform language also evolved. Notice where the arrow was pointing in the initial image for a bowl, and then how it evolved over the years. This is an example of a cuneiform text which survives from ancient years. 
It's announcing a tax cut. This was placed in public so that people could know that their taxes were actually being changed. Now that we've addressed some general characteristics of Mesopotamian life, we'll look at society and religion in more detail. Religion was an important part of people's daily lives. The Mesopotamians believed that humans were created to serve gods, therefore they had to offer sacrifices. If the gods were happy and they had received a lot of sacrifices, then the weather would be good. But if they didn't offer sacrifices and they weren't placated, then the gods would be upset and bad things could happen. The importance of religion was reflected in their architecture. Here we see a model of an ancient Mesopotamian city. Notice the walls around the entire city to protect them from invaders. The highest point in most of these cities was a ziggurat, where the arrow is pointing. Ziggurats could be physically huge structures. At the top, there was a temple for one or more gods or goddesses. Here we see the ruins of the ziggurat from the ancient city-state of Uruk. It's located in today's Iraq. It's currently under excavation by anthropologists. Here we see another ziggurat, and this one is at Ur, again in modern-day Iraq. There are three stairways to get to the top, one on the left, right, and then the center. And the walls are 50 feet high. The Mesopotamians wanted to please gods by erecting these monuments and offering sacrifices in the form of crops, successful hunts, and things like that. If they appeased the gods, then things would be okay. Otherwise, they could face problems. Here's a close-up of the same ziggurat, and you can see they were made of brick. Some ziggurats had mosaics like the lion that's shown here on the left. On the right, we see a photograph of a former student. This is Dave Thomas, who was stationed in Iraq several years ago. Here we see another photograph of Dave Thomas with a ziggurat in the background. Once again, I'd like to thank David for allowing me to use these images to show in class. If we were to look more specifically at their religion, we would learn that they were polytheists. The Mesopotamians believed in many different gods and goddesses. Possibly the major role or function for religion was to explain natural events, creation of the earth and the universe, as well as to explain things like the weather. They spent very little time concerned about the afterlife, in contrast to Christians. There was no reward for virtuous living during one's lifetime. The god shown here is Enlil. He was an important god who often influenced the success or failure of their crops because he controlled the weather. The Mesopotamians practiced slavery. It's unclear exactly what percentage of the population was enslaved. However, a person could become a slave if they developed some sort of a debt or if they were a prisoner of war. Probably about 80 to 90 percent of the population was directly involved in farming they needed that many people to farm in order to produce enough food. This shows another map of the region. While gold and copper and other items were mined, the pink areas or purple areas here that are shown uh, demonstrate where agriculture was the number one part of the economy. Most young people did not marry for love as marriages most often were arranged by parents. This typically involved an important contract between two families where the father of the bride would provide a dowry to the husband. Marriages, for the most part, were monogamous, but a husband could take a second wife. However, extramarital relations for women were not accepted. Divorce was relatively easy and it was accepted, and it could be equitable, particularly if a husband had been convicted of wrongdoing. However, for the Mesopotamians, a woman's proper place was in the home. We'll now study politics or how governments were organized in Mesopotamia. In 3000 BC, there wasn't one kingdom that ruled all of Mesopotamia. Instead, there were 10 or 12 separate city-states. Each was ruled by its own king. 
the arrows here point to some of those different city-states. Sumer, Lagash, Ur, Eridu, Uruk, Babylon. These are all different city-states within Mesopotamia. Politics was characterized by tremendous instability. Usually based upon the success or failure of their crops, rulers might rise or fall based on their popularity. Individual rulers were not gods on earth, however, they were representatives of the gods. There was no separation of church and state in Mesopotamia. Generally speaking, there were, might have been 10, maybe 12 different city-states within Mesopotamia. However, in the 1790s BC, one Babylonian king was able to unite all of Mesopotamia under his rule. He's shown here in this relief. His name? was Amurabi. One of the important characteristics of Amurabi's reign is that he issued a code of laws that people were supposed to live by. I was lucky enough a few years ago to travel to the Louvre in Paris. I was able to see this very famous code. It was awesome. The code itself listed a wide series of laws, but at the top of the code, it shows a relief of Amurabi who's sitting down, and he received this code of laws from a god. There were about 280 of these laws that dealt with issues such as justice and private property, how agriculture and trade should be regulated, as well as conditions for families and marriages. I'd like to identify some of these laws because they help to provide insight as to what the Mesopotamians valued. Here's one. If a man commits robbery and is captured, he shall be put to death. This tells us that they valued protection of private property. Here are two others. If a son strikes his father, they shall cut off his hand. A widower cannot seize his dead wife's dowry, but must save it for her sons. This tells us that they valued families. If a noble has broken another noble's bone, they shall break his bone. If he's destroyed the eye of a commoner or has broken the bone of a commoner, he shall pay one mina of silver. Notice, you get in trouble if you hurt somebody, but the rich and poor are treated differently. Finally, we see some issues involving gender relations. When she deserves it, a man may pull out the hair of his wife, mutilate or twist her ears, with no liability attaching to him. This tells us that for the Mesopotamians, women were not equal to men. Well, what's so important about this code? Well, it shows us that this isn't a Bill of Rights or a Constitution like the United States, because there's no equal treatment under the law for women or for people of different social classes. Also, the laws provided a code for ethical behavior. Well, one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to fill out a chart identifying some of the key traits of some of these ancient civilizations. And we'll start with Mesopotamia, and we'll see how we can identify religion, laws, and some other miscellaneous traits of some of these regions. So what are the major traits? Well, when it comes to religion, it helped to explain natural occurring events, particularly the success or failure of crops and prediction of weather. Secondly, we see that laws were written and they provided a code of ethical behavior. There was no equal treatment under the law and church and state were united. Also, they were polytheistic, they believed in many different gods and goddesses, and their society was characterized by uncertainty and instability. Well, I'd like to switch gears now and talk about ancient Egypt. Egyptian society is quite old. However, they have a major influence on us. One of the things that they provided was a new and more efficient writing tablet. Instead of having to use the clay, they invented papyrus. The word paper comes from the word papyrus, and papyrus was a plant. It's shown growing here, and just as our paper today comes from wood, papyrus came from this plant. The Egyptians are also known for something else. An ancient papyrus details the first recipe for toothpaste. It included lead, 
honey, incense, and powdered flint, and it dates from 1500 BC. People used it to polish their teeth. One of the key traits for Egypt's success over the millennia dealt with the Nile River and its importance. I'd like to talk about the Nile next. One historian described the river going through Egypt as the gift of the Nile because the Nile flooded every single year in late summer or early fall. It was quite regular. When the floodwaters receded, it left behind a thick mud that was maybe a foot and a half or two feet deep. There were so many nutrients in the soil that they could produce two series of crops each year. There was tremendous wealth in Egypt because they were, there were so many nutrients in the soil after the flooding of the Nile. Again, much of Egypt is located in the desert, but as you see here, if you brought water to different areas, you could grow all sorts of different crops. The Nile's flooding in the middle of the desert made the land livable on either side of the river itself. People could be 100, 200, 500 miles apart, but if they lived alongside the, the Nile, it created a sense of sameness and unity for people living in Egypt. Here we see some areas along the Nile today and an extensive irrigation system. Again, we've got a modern photo here. However, the irrigation pump that's being used here is similar to one that was used traditionally, centuries ago. Here we see a map identifying Upper and Lower Egypt. On either side of the Nile River, there was an area that was livable and there, a sameness developed, whether they were in the northern part or the southern part of Egypt. The Nile did something else as well. It created an efficient and dependable transportation system. People, trade goods, or limestone blocks might be transported from one part of the Nile to another on these sailing vessels called felucas. These are very similar to those which were used centuries ago. Life in Mesopotamia was characterized by instability. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers flooded and that helped, but it was irregular. In contrast, in Egypt, the Nile flooded the same way every single year, and it left that muck of nutrient-rich soil that led to tremendous crop yields. That's why the Egyptians were so amazingly prosperous. Well, the Nile had a major impact on life in Egypt. We'll now look at some political events and see how unification influenced prosperity as well. Egypt remained divided for many years, until about 3000 BC, when it's believed it was first united under the man shown here. His name was Menes. This brought an era of prosperity to Egypt, beginning about 3000 BC and extending to about 30 BC. This is a high point in Egyptian history. Menes may have been the first king to unite all of Egyptians, but over the years, the title for the king came to be known as Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh was known as a god on earth. Just like the Mesopotamians, there was no separation of church and state. There was no need for written law, because as a god on earth, whatever Pharaoh said became law immediately as he said it. People paid about 20% of their income to Pharaoh. In return, Pharaoh ensured prosperity. He did so because he made sure that the Nile flooded every single year without exception. Pharaoh was helped with his administrative duties with a series of governors called nomarchs, kind of like mayors or governors of today. Next, I'd like to look at some additional characteristics of society in Egypt, particularly their views on ethical behavior and status of women. A code of ethical behavior was provided by a concept called Mott. Egyptians believed that the universe was characterized by chaos. They wanted to ensure that this chaos did not rain down on the earth. In order to do this, they wanted to maintain the status quo. They wanted to make sure that things 
always stayed the same. Today we have this belief in progress in the United States that we're advancing with technologies and things like that. Well, it was the job of Pharaoh to maintain status quo because they wanted to make sure that the Nile flooded every year at the same time and it brought the nutrients to the soil. So Pharaoh was responsible for maintaining mot or justice to ensure that everything continued to be the same way it was. Pharaoh ensured that the poor would be fed, widows would be protected, as well as any orphans. And so it was the job of Pharaoh to maintain this in order to ensure that chaos didn't reign in earth and that the Nile continued to flood. This would ensure people's continued prosperity. Family life and women's lives were unique in Egypt as compared to Mesopotamia. First of all, a divorce was quite rare in Egypt. It could happen, but it would be rare. And women occupied a unique position for the ancient world in, in Egypt. Families traced their descent matrilineally, or through their mother, and items were inherited through one's mother rather than one's father. Women could own property. They could engage in trade and even traveled in public, sometimes with and even without an escort. And on some occasions, a woman could even become pharaoh. Didn't happen very often, but it could. Well, before we stop, I'd like to review some important concepts and ideas addressed in this lecture. Well, the focus of this lecture dealt with key traits of Mesopotamia and Egypt. When exploring society, we looked at religion, ethical behavior, daily life for men, as well as women, and even slavery in some cases. We also explored politics and society. Mesopotamian political system was characterized by instability, and their leaders were representatives of the gods. In Egypt, their lives were characterized by stability and prosperity. Pharaoh was a god on earth. A potential essay question might ask you to compare and contrast different characteristics of these two ancient civilizations. Well, today's presentation was on ancient civilizations. We'll pick up on some characteristics of Egypt, particularly the pyramids, on the next presentation, but hopefully you'll learn something new today. Have a good day.